Well, good morning. If you are uh, new to our church family or visiting, uh, Sandy is reminding me that our children need to go downstairs. That's not what I was going to tell you, but our children do need to go downstairs at this time um, for fantastic children's ministry opportunity this morning. But if you are new to our church family uh, or you're visiting, I uh, just want to let you know where we're at in our preaching series. We are in the middle of going through the Apostles' Creed uh, series, and we're actually coming to the conclusion of that series, and then we're going to kind of have a, a, a second portion of that series as we look at the Holy Spirit, uh, and that will be in the month of July. But today, we are looking at the last thing that we say we affirm and believe as Christians in the Apostles' Creed, and it is this. The Apostles' Creed says that we believe in the life everlasting, or we believe in eternal life. And i got to tell you, I'm so excited to be able to share uh, this message with you today because it's a message of hope and encouragement, and I hope you'll be blessed through it. You know, planted deep within our heart, uh, there is a longing for more. Uh, how many of you guys enjoy watching movies? A couple of you? I saw a couple of hands, like, shoot, way up. Um, Ruth and I enjoy watching movies. I love watching action flicks. And, uh, you know, in order for an action movie to resolve well, in order for you to say, man, this was awesome at the end of it, the good guy has to win, right? Yes. Uh, you know, in a romance movie, in order for us to say, man, this is a great movie, it felt good, I feel, you know, feel good about this, the girl has to get the right guy. She can't get, like, the dirtbag guy, right? She's got to get the right guy. Uh, you know, while I love action movies, I love adventure movies, there are times that I even get sucked into Disney movies, you know, watching them with my kids. And part of the reason for that is Disney movies end happily ever after, right? There's this desire within us for things to resolve well. There's this desire within us for things to turn out okay and even better than okay. Scripture says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, that God has set eternity in the human heart. This longing that we have within us for things to resolve well, for there to be something more out there, is given by God. And while we have this longing for something more, uh, I'm not always sure that we understand exactly what that looks like in the course of uh, putting the sermon together and kind of thinking about it over this, this last week. I talked to a bunch of folks who are mature believers, and I said, you know, what does eternity look like? What do you think eternity looks like? And this is some of the responses I got. In eternity, uh, there will be fields of flowers, and there will be animals that come up to me that I can talk with. Uh, for some, eternity involved floating on a cloud. I love this one, um, and I won't tell you who this is, but this person is on our staff. In eternity, I don't have to cook. Everything is prepared for me. That's pretty good. Another person said, in eternity, I'll be able to snow ski without getting cold. I kind of like that idea because I freeze. Um, in eternity, one person said, we won't be on another planet, but we'll also not be living in a spiritual realm here on Earth. Earth is just too messed up. So there was kind of like this ambiguity of where are we going to be in eternity, kind of an uncertainty. One person also uh, said there will be no more pain or suffering. We'll be with God and we'll be happy. And then another person said, maybe heaven uh, or eternity is what you want it to be. You know, I think this last statement kind of sums up what I heard. I mean, the reality is there's this vagueness about what people believe eternity will look like. There's differences of opinion in terms of what people think uh, everlasting life is going to be like. And while Jesus doesn't pin down every single thing for us, God has given us a lot of information about what eternity will look like. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, the text that I want us to look at today is in Romans 8, uh, in uh, verses 18 to 25. So if you open your Bibles to Romans 8, we're going to look at that together. And I'd like us to stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. Romans 8, 18 to 25. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the Son of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, 
Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until this present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope uh, for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, I love this passion uh, uh, that Paul evokes in this passage. I mean, he's just passionate about what is to come. And he makes clear that we live in this world that is subject to bondage and decay. That's falling apart. You know, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve uh, uh, sinned, their sin had ramifications on the entire biosphere. I mean, everything was cursed. The plant life was cursed. The animals were cursed. Humanity was court cursed. The entire universe was cursed when Adam and Eve made that, that decision. The earth as it is and what we know is not what God intended. And we know that. And I think black flies are part of that curse, right, in New Hampshire. Black flies are under the curse, and hopefully one day they'll be redeemed. I don't know what they're going to be redeemed into, but they're not going to be able to bite, I can tell you that. So we live under this curse, and we groan under this curse. We know that there is something more. There's something more to come. God's planted eternity in our hearts. He gives, uh, Paul gives a couple of uh, images of what creation is waiting for. First of all, Paul says that creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And this, uh, this personification, what he's kind of uh, giving us here is, it's like creation is waiting on its tiptoes. You know, it's kind of looking out, head bent forward, saying, when is the Son of Man, when are they going to be restored? When are they going to be glorified? Because when they're glorified, we'll be glorified. All of creation will be glorified. And then there's this, another analogy that Paul gives. He says uh, that creation waits as in the pains of childbirth. I was thinking about that. You know, this really is an image, image of, of uh, women going through the act of childbirth, the pain, the groaning that takes place in that. And some of you as ladies are saying, man, I, don't, I didn't groan. I screamed during childbirth, right? Uh, my wife wasn't a screamer. She was a, a groaner in childbirth. But that groaning, the pain that she experienced was not a purposeless pain. There was fulfillment on the other side of that pain. She was looking forward to something on the other side of that pain. It was an expectant pain knowing that there would be a child, as Heather just experienced a couple of weeks ago. This beautiful child. So we live in this place of being subject to decay, subject to bondage. We live in this place of, of, of suffering. We live in weakness. We have fr fragile bodies, and it makes us groan. We have uh, different um, challenges and opposition that comes up, and it makes us groan. We have stress in our life, and it makes us groan. We have a fallen nature. Uh, we say that we want to live a certain way, but we struggle to do that, and so we groan because we can't do what we want to do, as, as the Apostle Paul said. We have this groaning. But it's not just a groaning of pain. It's a groaning of expectation. We know that there's something more to come. So what is that something that the Apostle Paul talks about? There's been this long uh, history in the Christian church to describe eternity both as the already and the not yet. The already, what we already have related to eternal life in the here and now, in the not yet, what is coming. What is going to be, what eternal life is going to be for us on the other side of death. And I want to look first at the, the not yet of eternal life, and then we're going to finish up by looking at the already, what we already have. So the not yet of eternal life. Uh, Luke tells us this. He says that uh, God is going to restore everything at the end of time. He's going to restore everything. In Acts 3.21, that's what we hear. In 2 Peter 3.13 we're told that we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth 
a home of righteousness. And, you know, this existence that we're looking forward to, there will be a renewed heaven, there will be a renewed earth, and we will be living on it. Uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we think that it's going to be like an altogether different existence. But that's not true. I mean, Scripture says that what's around us will be a part of what we experience. You know, we're not going to be floating on a cloud for all of eternity. We're going to be living here on earth, on a restored earth, with a restored heaven. Uh, we're not going to live in some third world dimension or some alternate reality. That is not what heaven is all about. Scripture tells us that. Uh, next, uh, it says that creation is going to be restored. Creation is going to be restored. In Romans 8, it says that creation groans to be released from bondage to decay and to be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And I love this because it's the idea that creation is not superfluous. It's not like this add-on thing. It's not this extra. It's not like God said, I'm going to create humanity and then I'll go create creation too. Creation is important to God. Creation is going to be glorified again with us. In eternity, creation, what we see around us, is going to be brought into this even more full state. And we're going to have creation with us in eternity. John Stott says the universe is not going to be destroyed, but rather liberated, transformed, and suffused with the glory of God. I love that. I love that idea. Uh, fourth, uh, creation or eternity... Uh, the not yet, what we haven't are not yet experiencing, is, is going to be like the Garden of Eden, but better. It's going to be like the Garden, but better. Romans 8 says that creation wants to kind of go back to what was. And I want to remind you of what was in the Garden of Eden. It said that, you know, we're told in, in uh, Genesis 3 that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, literally having the presence of God with you. Well, we're going to have that, but it's going to be even better. It says that Adam had meaningful work in the Garden of Eden as he worked the garden. Scripture uh, tells us that it, they were surrounded, Adam and Eve, by exquisite creation full of peace and tranquility. There was, no more suffer, there was no suffering at that time or pain or sickness. None of that existed. And in the center of the garden was the tree of life, this image of eternal life. That's what Adam and Eve experienced in the garden. We have this hunger to get back there but have it be even better than what they experienced. And we see this when we get to the end of Scripture. When we get all the way to the end of the Bible in Revelation 21 and 22, that's the picture we get. It's like the garden, but it's better. Listen to what uh, John says in Revelation 21. This is verses 1 through 4, and it's going to come up here on the screen. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It's kind of like what the garden was like, right? But even better. In Revelation 22, 1 through 5, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, right down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood what? The tree of life, just like it did in the garden. Stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. What was done, the curse that was found in the garden, that's undone. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God Almighty will give them light and will reign with them forever and ever. Man, that is what is to come for us. That is awesome. That's incredible. And here's a couple of things just to kind of pull out pieces of what I see there. We're going to have an intimate relationship with God. And we know that. I mean, in eternity, we're going to have an intimate relationship with God. We're going to be able to come up and experience Him and talk to Him as we would a friend. He is going to be there, and we are going to be with Him in His physical presence. And that is amazing. 
Alistair McGrath says, to enter fully into eternal life is not to experience something totally strange and unknown. Rather, it's to extend and deepen our experience of the presence and love of God. What we have now in this relationship and intimacy that we're trying to build with Christ is going to just continue, but it's going to grow in eternity. Next, we'll have loving relationships with each other. And they'll be mature and whole and complete and healed. There won't be any sin, so there won't be any pride messing up relationships. There won't be any unforgiveness or bitterness messing up relationships. Our relationships will be whole. They'll be complete. Third, we'll have wholeness in ourselves. There won't be any more physical or emotional or psychological or sexual pain that we experience. There will be no more sickness or, or chronic pain or anxiety or depression or hurt from our past. There's not going to be any PTSD, ADD, ADHD, OCD, or RAD, or any other Ds that you can think of. They're all going to be gone, right? There will be no more dysfunction, no more disorders in heaven. We will be whole. We will be complete. Man, that is something to look forward to. Peter Cruft, I love this. He says, the martyr's wound will glow like gold, but the amputee's limb will be restored. And so will the brain-damaged person's intelligence. God's justice and mercy are perfect. And so is his style. And what a great statement about our wholeness that is to come. Uh, we're going to live in a, a kingdom of truth and beauty and goodness where God's rule and reign will bring all of that on. We'll live in this kingdom where his truth and his goody, goodness and his beauty is what we experience on a daily basis. There will always be uh, a foundation of compassion and justice and truth and love in God's kingdom. That's what we have to look forward to. We'll have meaningful work. And yes, we will work. We will work in the kingdom. But it'll be meaningful work. It won't be stressful work. God says that we're going to serve him. And I don't think it's like we're just going to you know, sit down like feeding him grapes, right? That's like the Greek image or whatever. That's not the Christian image of eternity. We're going to have work to do in eternity. But it will be purposeful work, like what God gave Adam to do in the garden. It will be work that satisfies. Work that brings us joy and fulfillment. We've got a lot to look forward to in eternity. And yet we, we groan. We, we groan for that which is still to come. Uh, one commentator said, he said, He who made paradise for Adam will make heaven and earth new, far beyond paradise in the consummation. For the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them in a way that is beyond what paradise ever knew. That is what we have to look forward to. The garden, and yet even so much better, where God's uh, restored heaven and earth are with us and a part of our existence. So that's the already, or that's the not yet. That's what we have to look forward to. But there's this already part of eternal life. There's this eternal life that we are already experiencing as Christians. Romans 8 says this. says, uh, creation groans, but not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I want to take a minute and just talk about this first fruits uh, image that Paul uses. You know, first fruits were literally the first fruits. It was the first fruits when you went out to uh, when the you know the folks in, in uh, Old Testament or New Testament biblical times when they went out to their fields and the crop was coming in, they'd go off and they'd take the first fruits that were produced on the grape uh, vine or the first fruits that were produced of wheat. It was the first fruits that were brought in during the harvest. And listen to this: the first fruits were the beginning of the harvest. In the promise that the full harvest would come in due time. That's what the Spirit gives us. We have the first fruits of the Spirit at work in our life. So while we don't have all that is uh, you know, in eternal life on the other side of death, we have parts of God's kingdom breaking into the here and now where we get to experience pieces of that. I mean, have you ever seen a, a person that has uh, come to faith in Jesus Christ. They've come out of darkness and into light. 
Have you seen a person who's come out of the deadness of their sin and of their past into the freedom and newness of life in Christ? Have you seen a person who has uh, come to faith in Jesus and their life has been radically transformed? It's been radically transformed because they have the first fruits of the Spirit of God at work in their life. They have eternal life beginning here and now within them. We can experience God when we come to Christ because the Holy Spirit is now at work in our lives. So we can have a relationship that we didn't have before. We can experience hope and peace and joy when we come to Christ. Something that we didn't necessarily have in our lives before. We can begin to experience the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Something that we didn't have before. Uh, we can begin to experience the truth and goodness and beauty of God's kingdom, a way in which we didn't live when we didn't have Christ, because now when we come to Christ, His Spirit lives within us, and we have the first fruits of His Spirit, which is pointing us towards what will be, pointing us towards eternal life, pointing us to all that's out there, and is breaking into the here and now. And we get to experience that and live within that. You know, to the woman at the well, Jesus, when He talked about salvation with her, and He said, I'll give you this living water. He described it this way. He says it will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It wasn't welling up to eternal life after she died. It was welling up to eternal life in the here and now. Her life was going to be transformed. It was going to be radically transformed. It was going to be new. It was going to be whole. Are you experiencing that? Are you experiencing that eternal life welling up within you now, so we talked about the eternal life of the, the not yet, what is to come, the eternal life of the here and now. Uh, I want to ask us a question. You know, how does that affect us? I mean, how does it affect the way that we live? Well, the Apostle Paul says that it gives us hope. We live with hope. Eternal life, the hope of eternal life, it gives us hope. It gives us, uh, eternal life gives us hope and perspective on our worst days. Gives us hope and perspective on our worst days. Tim Keller says this. He says, The way that you handle your present is completely determined by what you believe your future to be. The way that you handle your present is completely determined by what you believe your future to be. I, I recently heard of an analogy or an experiment that they did where there was two buckets of mice and there was water in the buckets and the mice had to swim. And one bucket of mice died and the other bucket of mice lived. And the only difference was this. The bucket of mice that lived uh, for a long, you know, much, much, much longer period of time, they were every, uh, every you know, few minutes, they were uh, picked up out of the water for a second or two and placed back in to continue to pound. Picked up, placed back in, continue to pound. It was the idea that they had hope that they were getting out. They had hope that they wouldn't just, you know, these other guys are just paddling, 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 paddling. But the ones that lived, being picked up every so often. They had the hope that they would live. Now, maybe that's a, a, a crude uh, analogy to use in this. Okay? Yeah, yes. But uh, maybe I won't use it second service. But, uh, but the idea is this. The idea is this. There is hope of eternal life. It changes the way that we live in the here and now. It changes the way that we live in the here and now. You know, in the midst of suffering... Do you live with hope that there is more to come? Um, uh, Paul says this. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with, what the, the, with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul believed that eternal life, the hope of eternal life, was not just the pipe dream. It wasn't just somebody made up. It wasn't just you know, some good idea. It was really going to happen. And he lived with that, and he lived through incredibly difficult circumstances. He would, was persecuted in every way that you can imagine. He lived with physical ailments. It says that his eyes were all you know, messed up. He lived with this spiritual uh, desire to always live out of the, the, the spirit, but he found himself living out of the flesh. He says, I do what I don't want to do. He, he, he suffered. And yet he lived with this hope saying, what's, what's to come far outweighs what we suffer with in the here and now. Do you live that way? That this isn't it. 
in the midst of whatever pain and whatever suffering is going on, there is something better to come. John Stott says the magnificence of God's glory will reveal, will, will greatly surpass the unpleasantness of our suffering. On our worst days, eternal life gives us hope. But you know what? Eternal life also gives us hope and perspective on our best days. It gives us hope and perspective on our best days. Have you ever had uh, like the perfect vacation? I've told you enough about Nant Nantucket. Ruth said, don't use that analogy again. That was like the perfect vacation, okay? Or, or, or the perfect day, the perfect moment. You know, there's times when it's like, you know, eternity, what, what is to come kind of breaks in. We get glimpses of eternity where we say, it just can't get any better than this. And that's awesome. That's exciting. But you know what? It's also dangerous. It's dangerous because when we begin to think like that, we start to live to recreate those moments. We start to uh, find our greatest fulfillment in this life instead of the life that is to come. And, and God absolutely wants us to enjoy this life. But man, what is to come is so much better, and so we're to keep our eyes focused on that. You know, when we take our eyes off of eternity, our focus begins to shift. It begins to shift on what satisfies us in the here and now. And that's a dangerous place to live. We begin to focus on ourselves instead of on God. We begin to focus on our kingdom down here, building our own little kingdom, instead of God's kingdom and what His kingdom looks like and what He calls us to in His kingdom. We get wrapped up in the things of this world to satisfy us instead of the things of God. I'll tell you, I had a moment like that uh, last weekend, we went to Dan Hole Pond. We were uh, camping up at Sentinel Pines, and I woke up one morning, and it was a pristine, beautiful morning. And I actually took a video of it, and I want to show that to you. And I said to myself, "Man, it just cannot get any better than this." So, just put your eyes up here for a moment. It's only 30 seconds. Seems like an eternity, doesn't it? <laughs> I looked at that, and I was like, man, I'm like, that is... I was just sitting there on the dock, and I'm just looking at all this, and I'm like, that is so incredible. I just can't get any better than this. Man, I just want more of this today and tomorrow. And then I remembered what Romans 8 said, as I was thinking about this sermon. Creation groans. In the midst of how absolutely pristine and gorgeous and beautiful that was, creation groans. There is so much more to come. And in our own lives, sometimes we think, man, it can't get any better than this. And yet our spirit groans, even if we don't know it, for something more. Because there is so much more to come. And do we keep our eyes focused on that? God says eternity is going to be off the charts I mean, it's going to be through the roof. It's going to be more than what we could ever imagine. Do we believe that? On our best days, eternal life can give us hope. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.18, he says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, or not on what is unseen, but on what is seen. Sorry, let me, let me read that again. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As we come to the communion table this morning, I want to ask you the question, are you living this eternal life that Jesus has to offer? Are you living it in the here and now? Do you have hope of it for the future? When we began the service, uh, or as we talked through this morning, we said that uh, the tree of life was both in uh, the very beginning of the story in Genesis 3, and it's at the end of the Christian story in Revelation 22. That tree of life is uh, essentially a symbol of eternal life. But in order for us to get the tree of life, Jesus had to climb onto the tree of death. You know, Jesus um, 
lived a, the good and perfect life that we should have lived. And Jesus died the death that we should have died. And when he went on to the cross, he took our sin upon himself so that we could live in freedom, so that we could uh, be free of our sins, so that we could be in a relationship with God, so we, we could experience this eternal life that he offers us. Have you received him? Are you living with that expectation of eternal life in your life this morning? Jesus said, if, you know, if you're not, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But if we come to him, we can come to the Father as well. And we begin, can begin to live this eternal life that he offers. Let's pray.